Welcome back to World War Now, everybody. I am your host, Conrad Franz, joined as always by Dimitri Kaligan. It's not just me tonight. Dimitri, how are you? I'm doing great, Conrad. It's been a busy two weeks. Um, I have been a bit, little bit AWOL around here and really not posting much on Twitter, on the Substack, but I'm looking forward to you know, getting back into it. There's been a lot of incredible events in the last two weeks and things are really escalating towards the end of 2022. What an eventful year we've had so far. Oh, it's 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 been one of the most eventful years, and you know, I guess as people get, we you know, we're both young men. As people get older, you know, every year gets more eventful in some way. But I think this one's a bit of an exception with you know war and everything like that. But with all that being said, you know, we have a lot to talk about. Whether it's a new front opening up possibly in Kosovo and Serbia, you know, you know, the front line being braced for future offensives in Ukraine. You know, there's big things happening with Estrelkov and Viktor Boot and things in the news. We're probably going to bring up the German coup and then beyond that you know yay is talking about stuff totally vindicating what we've been saying on this show since the very beginning there's obviously stuff going on in cyprus so we're going to talk about all of this but with all that being said we're going to hop right into kosovo serbia there's big things going on there you know a for orthodox people a very relevant you know conflict one of the most before ukraine kosovo serbia was like the most relevant big you know modern war kind of that had happened in in europe you know between christian peoples and all these sorts of things so Dimitri, what are uh, what are your initial thoughts on this on these developments? Yeah, essentially, for those who don't understand, Kosovo is a region south of Serbia that is considered technically it's maybe easy to call Kosovo maybe the Washington D.C. of Serbia. It was the old one of the old one of the most densely populated Orthodox Christian regions of ancient Serbia, the first Serbian kingdoms, and even the Serbian Empire, which existed for a short time in the medieval period. And of course, in the 1990s, after the dissolution of the um, U- U- um, the Soviet republics of Yugoslavia, Kosovo was deemed by NATO independent from Serbia. So essentially it is a Serbian province which has been disconnected forcefully from Serbia and is now being held as a sort of neutral ground between all these various ethnic groups. And at the moment, if tensions are heating up, I think there is this uh, need, at least there's this drive among Serbian people and Serbian Orthodox Christians that want to return Kosovo to Serbia in a similar fashion perhaps to some highly patriotic Russians who want certain regions of Ukraine to return back to default. And yeah, we're seeing the same sort of tensions in in Serbia at the moment. They're building up at the moment. Of course, no military action has been taken, but very strong political rhetoric is being thrown around by the president of Serbia, um, oh, the prime minister of Serbia, Vucic. Yeah, no, Vucic uh, has been, you know, while on one hand, you know, he always portrays Serbia as this EU candidate, he's also, you know, made sure to maintain frame because Serbian public opinion is very strong on the on the Kosovo issue. So he's, you know, he's what we're seeing recently with, you know, we're seeing videos of helicopters flying over Kosovo airspace and everything like that. And to forgive people a little more background, there's always been a big dispute in the northern region of Kosovo on the border with, you know, Serbia proper, you know, of internationally recognized Ser- of Serbia, is uh, there's this license plate dispute on whether or not Serbs, ethnic Serbs, would have to have Kosovar license plates, and if not, they would be fined or have to be stopped at checkpoints and all these sorts of things. And of course, Serbia had been lobbying on the behalf of the ethnic Serbs in northern Kosovo, Matohia, to not have to do that, to be to basically able as much as they can to live as registered Serbs without having to submit to what is effectively, you know, an Albanian ruled slash NATO ruled government in Kosovo. And of course, that spilled over. The um, ethnic conflicts have been heating up, and in the past two times, I believe, in the past two or three months, there's been these barricade issues on the border where the Serbs, you know, build these barricades to stop police from from forcing roadblocks and these other sorts of things. And because there's always these pictures floating around, it always just gets kind of parodied in the Western media as, oh, the Serbs are at it again, you know, these contentious, you know, nationalist Orthodox people in the Balkans that just can't stop causing trouble for this otherwise peaceful region. That, that, except that's we know that that's not the story, and I want to read a little bit here. You know, we're seeing well, the real story of Kosovo has been Albanian expansionism since the start. The entire Kosovo project has been a project to just create a complete Muslimification, Muslimication of this formerly Orthodox land. And I'll just read a few things here. Kosovo Albanians, with the support, this is from AZ Geopolitics, with the support of armed police, seized power in the municipality of Severna Mitrovica. This was stated by the head of the office for Kosovo and Metohija under the Serbian cabinet, Pitar Petkovic. According to him, Albanians, by legal violence and unilateral actions, took the deputy seats belonging to Serbs. No one voted for them, and they have no support from the Serbian people. The building of the local parliament where the new deputies took the oath was cordoned off by armed Kosovo police. And there's videos of all this. You can see it on our telegram. But yeah, I mean, we're seeing this. And then an even more unfortunate news. 
Uh, residents of the village of Bogosevac near Prizren have said that Albanians looted several Serbian houses. The local police, the local populations lost everything, and the Church of St. Nicholas, built in the 16th century, was also looted. And for people who know their Balkan history, they know that you see the pictures from 1999, from the early 90s. Every time these new waves of Albanians have moved into Kosovo over the past 40, 50 years, especially at times when, you know, extremism is more rampant, and before, you know, some of the more Western interventions happened, especially like the initial gains of territory and incursions and driving away of Serbs was, you can see these pictures of them climbing up these huge ancient churches, you know, from the Byzantine era, pulling down their crosses, lighting them on fire, you know, replace it, you know, defe desecrating them and all sorts of things. So this, this isn't anything new, but it's just, you know, it's very, it's very disheartening to see, unfortunately, considering how de-Christianized Kosovo and Matoya has been, it's just, it's hard to be... It's hard to see it going better because the Serbs can even only do so much because it, it basically would lead to a direct confrontation with NATO if they did what was necessary to actually secure, you know, the Christian population there. However, we have seen uh, what the Russian foreign ministry stated recently that they would provide, and I'm quoting here, total support to the Serbian government defending their national interests and the Kosovo and certain European countries are playing with fire. So this is very much relevant to the current conflict, not just because, you know, it's def like between Russia and Ukraine, there's probably no other more orthodox, quote unquote, historic conflict than Serbia Kosovo. But I, I think Dmitry would agree. I very much view this as a as a likely second front opening up if NATO decides that they're gonna put their foot down. Yeah, of course. And essentially, if Serbia does, you know, forcefully try to secure justice and peace in Kosovo and prevent some of these Albanian atrocities from say, affecting the local Serbian people of the of the Kosovo region. The first country which will be involved directly through NATO is the uh, Italy, which, uh, you know, as recently we know, Maloney, the new Prime Minister of Italy, an incredibly right-wing lady, you know, blonde, blonde hairless, sort of blue eyes from, from Northern Italy, like won, won, the, won the election in Italy, but is a, essentially is considered this sort of, uh, I, like a restoration of Italian values, and it, mind you, Italy, Italy has sent, according to NATO, NATO has requested that Italy does send troops to to Kosovo to hold the peace. So, of course, the first people affected by, say, Serbian intervention in Kosovo will be the Italian troops stationed there. So, of course, NATO is directly um, will be directly, I guess, uh, under pressure to act against Simlin. How you know they were acting in Poland when you know. Polish citizens were under threat from Russians as well as Ukrainians and the recent Ukrainian conflict. So what we're going to see is, uh, again, this, I guess, opening of a second front, as Conrad said, but there is, again, the growing risk of if NATO does intervene into Kosovo, into, into, into Serbia like they did in the 1990s under Bill Clinton, will there, would there be a, I guess, would there be any um, return from Russia? At, at the same time, Serbia has supported Russia at least since the Kherson has fallen in early November. So the city of Kherson in Ukraine, of course, fell to Ukraine in on, the, on November the 11th. And the Serbians, the Serbian foreign minister, as well as some of the other high, highly uh, uh, highly ranked ministers, including the president, Vucic, they did say, look, we are very sorry that Russia lost the city of Kherson to Ukraine, and we fully support Russia. And we do not see this as a military loss. I think they said, look, the battle is lost, but the war is still ongoing. Russian liberation of Kherson is still on the cards. So Serbia has always had this very friendly attitude towards Russia. This has been, of course, in, if you guys know the history books, this has been on the cards since the 1800s. Serbia and Russia have always had a very close, um, I guess, relationship. And the question is whether or not if Serbia does choose to take this uh, opportunistic and power, you know, sort of powerful move in Kosovo, would Russia support, a, again, in a military fashion, uh, or simply through providing weapons and technology, maybe even some of those Iranian drones which, which are served so, you know, to be so effective in the Ukrainian conflict? I guess these are, they, all these are all things which we're going to be looking out for in the coming months. No, it's so interesting that you bring up Italian influence and their troops being the highest, you know, the most well represented in the K4, you know, the kind of deployment that occupies Kosovo is that, you know, what what happened in, you know, Mussolini's time, he invaded Albania, you know, it was they, they they tried their best, you know, to get in there, you know. And now we have what Albanians I mean now we have Italians acting on behalf of Albanian invading forces. You know, it's just a bit of a it's a bit of a funny switch around. But I think I and mean, we also have to remember, you know, the very relevant I guess not so recent, but you know, very relevant Christian, you know, Occidental history of World War One, which you know, even in the Normie books, you realize, you know, what happened? 
Austria-Hungary attacks Serbia, Russia responds. That's how World War I, you know, started. And we, of course, could get into the Black Hand and the Masonic crypto pre-Zionistic influence that was going on there. But at its most basic level, the, the other empires attacking Serbia and doubting Russia's loyalty to Serbia is something we've seen before. So we on the show would recommend to any Western leaders listening to not do that, but we don't think they listen to us. And I think one of the other greatest examples of Russia, say, not supporting Serbia ended in a tragedy for Russia. Now, this is, of course, going back like World War One. Russia, of course, protected Serbia from Austria, Hungary and Germany. But in World War Two, funny enough, the Yugoslavian Communist Republic had a relationship with the USSR, a defense pact. And guess what? The USSR did not back up Yugoslavia against Nazi Germany. So Nazi Germany, when they invaded Yugoslavia in June of 1941, Stalin held back and actually did not support uh, the Yugoslavian Serbs. In World War One, uh, World War Two, that is, and until until of course, uh, I think Yugoslavia fell quite quickly in about a month or two. And where did Hitler go next after Yugoslavia was defeated and Stalin stood back? Of course, uh, the Nazi Germany began Operation Barbarossa, and you know, the Soviet Union was engaged in full now fully fully impacted by World War Two. So that's a good example of say Russia actually sitting back and again. Maybe the 90s is another example when Russia was being led by the liberal, uh, you know, the early version of the United R Russia Party, led by Yeltsin, led by Nemtsov, and all of these, like, cringe liberal left-wing candidates. It did not support Serbia in its, I guess you could call it full-on war and NATO intervention in into Yugoslavian relations in Kosovo. The first great civil war in Yugoslavia in the 1990s, Russia's, again, stood back. And what was the what were the fruits of this? Well, Russia had its own, ended up having its own civil conflict in uh, Chechnya, mainly, of course, supported also by CAA agents, foreign influence. So, again, every time throughout history, it seems that whenever Russia does not support Serbia in some of, you know, pursuing its sort of righteous and, I guess, historically justified goals, uh, the it's almost like a karmic sort of justice. It hits Russia. It always gets Russia back. So, I think there is certainly some sort of historical parallels here, which Russian Russian foreign ministers and Russian diplomats do need to pay attention to. Well, it's God, you know, making sure everyone knows we need orthodox unity, right? No, no, it's just very relevant because we're, we're seeing the Ukraine, you know, if you get to this, we consider like Russians are not going to be, we, we don't believe they're holding their current position as if they're holding it as if this is, this could be the line that we draw, we might negotiate and this could be where we stop. It's not like that. They're it's existential between Putin and all the leaders have made it very clear that they're uh, fighting this thing basically to its to its logical end, and that and they seem to be very prepared for that to mean, you know, it actual direct confrontation with the West. And if they're saying that alongside saying that they will support Serbia and everything that it does, I think it really shows how prepared. I think it shows that we're more in a World War One situation than it is we're in a Chechnya situation or a 1991 situation or definitely, or, you know, a 1999 situation, whatever. I think, as we've talked about on the show so many times, we've we've returned to history, we've returned to reality, and I'm thinking this could be, this is just one of those many fronts, and there's stuff going on in Armenia, Azerbaijan as well, we won't get into as many details, but... You know, World War Three is here. Like you know, that's kind of what we've been saying this, and this is these are the kinds of things that you're going to see. And like the the World War One parallels are interesting enough, but beyond that, just that doesn't even even if the parallels weren't there, I think the the, the conclusion would be the same. Yeah, I think all well, points need to be made. The fact that you know the Ukrainian conflict has opened a lot of doors. You know, early on in 2022, now that we're reaching the end of the year, just recall some of the stories coming out. Well, is it time for China to invade Taiwan? Is it time for say Turkey to invade Syria? Well, some of those things have actually come to pass. Like Turkey is in fact crossing the border into Syria, crossing into Syria's foreign sovereign territory, and of course uh, dealing with the Kurds as it wishes. And we see similar actions in Azerbaijan, Armenia. The Russian-Ukrainian conflict has has opened up many of these doors. Putin's special military operation has, in fact, it's essentially tearing unipolarity, you know, like at the seams, tearing it apart. And the U.S., um, you know, it'll be a great challenge for the United States to sort of hold its hegemony through its hegemony, sort of hold all of these different pieces on the border in place. Like, can it actually retain its influence at, uh, in, in all these countries? And Kosovo is the next front, and Vucic as well as the Serbian Parliament, I think they're willing to actually push the envelope that little step further but i guess moving on to the ukrainian uh ukrainian russian conflict at the moment uh things have uh things have been kind of steady in a in a very bloody and i guess 
horrendous way, you could say Ukraine is pouring troops into the city of Bakhmut. Bakhmut essentially is this uh, point in between the two Russian Donbass main major cities, Lugansk in the north and Donbass in the southwest, uh, Donetsk that is. And so between Donetsk and Lugansk is the city of Bakhmut and Ukraine is eagerly trying to hold Bakhmut. Bakhmut is uh, essentially in this valley region and the Russians are holding the high ground on the eastern side and just pounding Bakhmut with Torrance rockets, essentially shooting it uh, shooting any any Ukrainians that show up on their radars, and of course Ukraine is not 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 actually backing away. It just seemed like a sort of suicidal attempt at holding the city. And even Western media sources are a little bit confused, saying, "Well, on one hand, Putin's allegedly running out of rockets and running out of missiles. On the other hand, well, no, the Ukraine he is actually taking heavy losses in the city of Bakhmut. Why do they want to hold it? What's the point? I mean, I kind of see it from the Ukrainian perspective. Holding Bakhmut will give them a sort of a spearhead from where they can either attack Lugansk or other attack Donetsk in the south. It is this in-between point. It's, it is like a crossroads position for them. But Russians, of course, are not actually pushing into Bakhmut. They're sitting back. They're, they're taking their time, shooting electric power, power stations in the background. And, of course, on the forefront, powering like just pow pounding these uh ukrainian defensive positions in the city um again this this conflict is really uh at a certain stalemate here and we're kind of waiting for to see how the winter develops now that we're about halfway through december at this point just so people are aware odessa has been like completely out of power for days now and when it comes to aid from the West, sure, there's some money still coming in. But, for example, the U.S. talked about, you know, the, the Ukrainians have been begging for Patriot missile systems. And the U.S. said they're going to send them one, which I guess that's, it's a bit of an escalation because before they'd said they weren't going to send any Patriot systems. But if they're sending one, it's clear we're starting to see the kind of symbolification of the aid to the point where I guess people at home still want to play it for, you don't want to seem necessarily like they're abandoning Ukraine because then, you know, the Ukrainian voices have been so amplified that it would be a bad political look. But at the same time, they have, it seems pretty obvious that they know that the silly get Crimea back rhetoric is gone. And in many ways, the Zelensky regime itself is likely toast. So whether the Pentagon and the CIA and all those people are looking for an out from Zelensky is yet to be seen. But they're clearly, you know, if they were playing to win, they would have just sent them a bajillion Patriot systems or whatever and just continue to declare crypto war on Russia and send more mercenaries and everything. But that might still be happening a bit behind the scenes, but it's it's clear that there's a bit of a, a bit of a, I don't know, a, a pullback on the gas a little bit on that front. Yeah, so on the Russian domestic front, we have this uh, emergence of this Victor Boot, the famous arms dealer, recently returned from, uh, you know, being captured by the CIA in American prison. He was returned to Russia, and what was his first move? Of course, it wasn't to particularly uh, entertain some sort of Ukrainian, uh, you know, Ukrainian involvement, but he did join the far right Russian party in the parliament named the LDPR. Of course, this is the party which was led by Zhirinovsky until his passing in 2021 from COVID. So, uh, actually, 2022 passed recently from COVID. And Zhirinovsky's right wing party was always, would have been, and is at the moment in support of the Russian Ukrainian conflict of special military operations. So, you have this famous arms dealer essentially now on the Russian. Um, I guess you can say multimedia and supporting a Russian PR. It's just these very fantastical figures. But on the other hand, in Russia, the recent uh, return of Igor Strelkov to back to Russia, his um, military his military pass has been suspended, and he isn't actually allowed to participate in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict any longer. And the special military operation, not even as a volunteer, frankly, or actually anyone in command. And this move by the Russians to suspend one of their most, I guess. One of the most famous, uh, like ground level commanders, and re you know, forcefully return him back to Moscow is um, could be a loss in terms of PR because now Igor Strelkov, with his over six hundred thousand um, subscribers on Telegram, is posting incredibly harsh anti-Russian military rhetoric in terms of he's not actually against the troops, but he's against the Russian military leadership, critiquing every single mistake that the Russian military makes. And of course, Ukraine has also figures like that on its end, but Igor Strelkov has probably the largest audience of almost any Russian, um, you know, qualified commentator on the military end, and he's he's a, he's heavily against the Minister of Defense. He's heavily he's actually he does prefer Putin to some of the other politicians. But yeah, Russia does have all this weird churning, these big events happening behind the scenes, of course, and a lot of yeah, a lot of these things will of course uh, come to fruition next year when, of course, you know, Russia either succeeds or does not succeed in some of its uh, short term goals. Well, I think there's a lot of uh, on the one hand. There does seem to be some consensus on with Surovikin's leadership and some of the with Kherson and with the artillery 
you know, the increased artillery finally targeting civilians. There's some unity, but at the same time, it seems that there might be some disconnect between the people on the front and those on the military, you know, operating, you know, full time on the home front. Because I believe even recently it was some kind of big, you know, drone went like seven, like went into Kursk, I believe, in into Russia, like deep, deep, deep into Russia, which is obviously it didn't actually do anything. And even if it had even like it couldn't have even done anything dramatic if it had wanted to. But the fact that it was allowed at all shows that there's there, there, there might be some disconnect between the Russian home front and then the front line right now, which again, not everything that Strelkov says is true. He's a bit of a doomer sometimes, but it does point to that patriots are not exactly in control as much as some people might want them to be. But I'll let Dimitri, if you want to have anything you want to say on Ukraine, I'm going to move on, and we got to hear a bit from Ye, but I want to hear what you have, your final thoughts on Ukraine. Maybe I've heard, I've heard some murmurings of possible future referendums being planned for Odessa, maybe Chernigov, Mikolaev, Kharkov. You know, that's obviously... There needs to be some. There needs to be some movement before that happens. But I've heard these things, which could indicate, you know, Russia's willingness to their their, their rump state, if it even happens, is also going to be farther in. We're not. They're not going to have a. They're they're going to really be reclaiming some of these territories. Yeah, I think the Russian obsession with uh, international law and everything being somewhat legal is uh, kind of, uh, you know, it's being prepared right now. They are preparing, uh, you know, Nikolaev, Odessa, Zaporozhye as well. These these cities, which Zaporozhye technically is already part of the Russian Federation and the Constitution, just not physically. It's still under, uh, um, quote unquote, Ukrainian occupation. So you have all these cities and Russia's preparing these referendum plans for all these cities, these huge administrative actions, which it'll most likely take once the Russian troops do move into these territories. Again, at the moment, according to Western media sources, Russia is failing in Bakhmut. It is failing on almost all fronts. And uh, of course, the fronts are going to be pushed all the way back and Russia will lose, definitely lose Lugansk and Donetsk, if not Crimea itself. And so the rhetoric really on the Western end is not aware that these referendum preparations are taking place. Now, the, the other thing I think everyone should notice is the fact that almost all peace talk negotiations have ceased at this moment. Russia is simply not planning for a negotiation at this point. There is no there's no talk about it. There is This is in the month of December, at least in the last three weeks, any sort of rhetoric about peace talks have gone out the window on both Zelensky's end and on the Russian end. And everyone is focusing very heavily on these areas around Bakhmut, around the south of Kherson. Uh, you know, Ukraine, of course, is doubling down. Everyone is uh, very, um, I guess both sides are quite content with the way things are going. And Zelensky, as well as his wife, are pushing these PR messages that, look, Ukraine will withstand Russia. Ukraine will hold for two, three years. Ukraine is ready to, you know, whip withstand this Russian siege of its motherland, which, you know, we think that's a little bit unrealistic, but uh, again, we'll see how things go. No, again, I, I think, you know, there, there's a chance that the Ukraine resistance to Russia might continue beyond Zelensky, but if it does, I think that would be short-lived. I can't imagine that situation not being very chaotic with a lot of internal violence, which they're, they're, they're barely able to deal with the external violence. So that's not to laugh, but I think that's the, the, once Zelensky goes, it'll be a quick, it'll probably be a quick surrender of the general, you know, Ukrainian resistance to the, to Russia's further resistance and war against the West in their within their borders. But with all that being said, you know, we've we, we've kind of laid out we're back to true world war now form, you know, laying out the fronts of the ongoing, you know, third world war and who is vindicating us entirely, uh, Mr. Ye West. So I want to uh, play a quick clip that we have from our telegram of one of his recent uh, clubhouse spaces that I referenced on my solo episode. This was from the censored portion that I, I clipped it. We'll uh, listen to that. They're spiking the punch. TikTok is spiking the punch. Disney is spiking the punch. They are making our kids question their sexuality early on purpose to cause confusion. And that is part of this new war, this new war order that we're a part of, we're already in World War III and don't even realize it. And guess, you know who told me we're already in World War III? Who told you? Harley Pasternak. What? You think he might know? You <laughs> try and find out. <laughs> he told me that like two or three years ago. Information. Is the war. Information is the war. We're already here. Why you think I posted war? And I sure went to it, didn't I? <laughs> now we know. 
Would you say? <laughs> yeah, so I think listening to EA's recent words, just the keep in mind, if EA, if EA say was an Orthodox Christian, I think people would be a lot more, I guess they'd be, lot, they'd be listening a lot more closely to some of his words. It's it's very interesting to see that he he's taking this position as a certain like fool for Christ, this like clairvoyant prophet. He's really just saying things out loud, no filter. He's just saying what's coming to his mind, whether or not it's real or unreal. And some of it, of course, it's notice it's coming with a comedic portion as well. So just those regular fools, fools for Christ, you know, made fun of themselves. Kanye puts on this black gimp mask, appears on the Alex Jones show. He's he's ridiculing himself, speaking about his own sins. Notice he talks about the. The fact that he was addicted to pornography, the fact that his wife left him, things of that nature, things that an, an actual person with pride and ego would probably avoid. But no, Ye is very openly speaking about his weaknesses, speaking about his um, his faults and sins and flaws. And it's very interesting how he's making these very clear statements, almost mirroring the words of Metropolitan Neophytus and Morphin, not saying that Ye is anyway equivalent to the Venerable Metropolitan, but it is very interesting that these great minds in the world today do think very much alike and you know everyone is seeing what what we're i guess moving towards at this point i mean who who did you hear that from he says it right at the end he says harley pasternak who's we know his mk ultra you know zionist canadian intelligence handler who why is he like randomly opining about his like weird geopolitical knowledge that he probably learned at some you know shady meeting in tel aviv you know, he was probably bragging, you know, in a room with Ye and some other people like, yeah, like, you know, I know, like, I'm not just your handler, like, I'm like, I'm your connected guy, like, I'm your Illuminati guy, like, I know, like, what's really going on, I know who's pulling the strings, I know who's controlling the wars, like, you know, that's part of the reason they're so afraid, like, sure, the biggest reason is, you know, Ye's, you know, naming the things that refuse to be named, but he, he's really pulling this curtain back, and so much stuff that people had known for a while, it wasn't as controversial to talk about, but had just been completely relegated to the realm of, you know, schizophrenic nonsense, conspiracy, you know, your uncle talks about this at the barbecue and it's whatever, but now it's just being completely vindicated. And he's obviously having to play it a certain way because we know these are the kinds of people that just kill people. So he's had to put up these kind of defenses, you know, like he's had to name Harley Pasternak because now Harley Pasternak can't get to him because he's under public scrutiny. You know, it's it's smart, but it's also like pretty obvious to do that. So it's important that all of that is happening. But I want to just be sure that we read the exact words of Metropolitan Neophytos as well, who we, we read these words when we started the show. And it's he said, we are living in the second and a half year of the Third World War, but they simply are not saying this to us. And what did Ye say? He said, Harley told him this about two to three years ago. So again, not not to say that this is some, you know, that there's this this exact plan that everybody's aware of, but in general... You know, this guy who has access to the people that plan out wars, who, you know, sell weapons, who control debt, and then a, then a holy man who's, you know, had access out of, throughout his entire life to saints and clairvoyant elders, he, you know, is able to spiritually discern the fact that we are also at that stage in the Third World War. It, 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 it's very clear that we are moving in this direction, and whether it's go again we've we have we've all these different fronts we could we could talk for four hours about every single conflict most of them having to do with proxy wars between the u.s russia and china whether it's myanmar you know china taiwan you know the chinese indian border uh, all sorts of these places like these are all places that you know if you had a world war three chart that have a little bit of it would be somewhere on there you know connected with you know charlie day style with red yarn but these this is this isn't just schizophrenic nonsense. This is just the geopolitical reality that we live in. And we eventually it's going to it's gonna get even hotter. And whether that's the next five years, ten years, twenty years, we don't know for certain. But I think to say that we are in the third world war is just it's not just true, but totally vindicated these past, you know, eight, nine months. Yeah, and just kind of bring it back to bring it back to I suppose more of the on the esoteric end, like some of the things people were saying for the last eight years that look the Minsk Accords and Ukraine between Ukraine, Russia, and all these European countries, Minsk One and Minsk Two, they were simply, you know, some of the more right wing Russians as well as esoteric figures in the West were saying all oh, these Minsk Accords are useless. They they they're not actually stopping. They're not actually for made for peace to you know, procure peace between Ukraine and Russia. And what has what has happened in the last two weeks? The former, um, you know. The Chancellor of Germany, Merkel, Angela Merkel, has openly said, openly stated, which Putin's already reacted to, that look, the the Minsk peace accords, they weren't actually for peace. They were to buy time for Ukraine to rearm and retrain its troops since 2014. So, what this means is that this last these last eight years, the Ukraine was being openly prepared by NATO, by Germany, by the United States to actually 
fight back Russia. And this is, of course, one of the greatest revelations we've had in the last fortnight. An open, an open, I guess, a, a open, an open statement, an open witness from one of the great NATO leaders, Angela Merkel, that look, yeah, this was the reality for the last eight years. And mind you, if you would have said this in 2016, either you were Russian, German, American, you would be called a conspiracy theorist. But no, it's coming to the forefront now. And even more esoteric news, I suppose, from Germany, of course, the recent German coup, Conrad, like, uh, you know, for Prince Heinrich the Thirteenth for the House of Royce and some of his right, far right wing colleagues. This, this is a German aristocrat who was a descendant of the Russian, of t essentially two Russian imperial Tsarist families, right? The, that's the family of St. Vladimir who baptized Russia and, of course, the family related to St. Nicholas II as well and Emperor Paul and the Romanovs. So this German aristocrat essentially rising up to the forefront and uh, trying to, you know, allegedly, uh, you know, cause a coup in his particular German region. Like, I'm sure there's more to the story, but at this point, like how the West is betraying is that this uh, German prince was an absolute, um, you know, it was absolutely insane and he was a far right wing and almost a, like a neo-Nazi, but that's not really the case, is it? No, they're just totally J6ing these guys. And I was listening to a good podcast that had a uh, Geo on it. Uh, Geo's aesthetic uh, corner on on Twitter, and he was talking. I agree with him in the sense that I I'm very skeptical that the people that are actually getting uh you know railroaded and you know, all getting arrested were you know actually you know whether they were feds or whether they were you know actually you know schizos involved in some kind of conspiracy. I have a strong feeling that this is kind of a Gretchen Whitmer situation, like in America, where it was you know a few conspiracy boomers and some former politicians and some people that you know like to reminisce about when they maybe had a bit more power in the police or in the military. They probably had some group chats, maybe they had some conferences, maybe they had some meetings at Prince at Royce's castle and some parties and some messages were exchanged that involved, you know, speculation and they're expressing their disdain for the government and all this kind of stuff. And next thing you know, the Germans saw an opportunity to do a full J6 before what? Before the big protests, the, the, the public opinion starts to shift towards Russia, which has always been a danger in Germany ever since, you know, the first clash of empires has happened, you know, at the big end of the 19th century. So I think it's very important to uh, be aware of, watch virtue German legislation regarding, you know, speech about Russia, regarding political parties. Because remember, the AFD, you know, they've, to be right wing in Germany, you have to completely avoid any hint of national socialism, Nazism, even certain forms of just basic German patriotism, which is very sad. Germany is just totally still occupied by the global American empire. But the AFD has done a good job of, you know, just being a true dissident party. They've embraced a lot of the kind of anti-COVID stuff, a lot of the, and they've embraced, you know, kind of a multipolar vision and just, you know, rapprochement with Russia in many ways, kind of emulating the French right, which has done a good job of this. But sure enough, you can't have too much of a good thing. And they've, you know, Germany decides that they need to crack down on that. And this won't be the first time the AFD, I mean, I believe they're already like perpetually surveilled they're like under federal, which I don't even know how that is legal, considering that they're, I believe, the fifth largest party in the Bundestag, second largest right wing party. And I believe it was some of, not just, you know, Heinrich Royce, you know, the 13th was arrested, but it was also, you know, former AFD MP Brigitte Malsack Vinkman and uh, a few other AFD representatives and the local council members. So they're going to use this to go after the AFD. They're probably going to use this to go after anyone who's, you know, flown a German imperial flag, you know, a Second Reich flag in public. So, you know, they the swastika was banned, the Third Reich was banned, the Second Reich's going to get banned, and now, you know, they're going to, they're eventually they're just going to ban, you can't fly, eventually they're just going to ban all flags in Germany that aren't the LGBT flag. So just, <laughs> I'm sorry, Burger Bros. I mean, as my name is, as a German myself, it makes me sad. And as I said in my solo episode, which I encourage everyone to go watch, you know, episode 10.5, I, I do still believe that despite all this repression, the Germans have, their spirit has yet to be so extinguished as the as the neutered Anglos. So I believe there's still hope and the, the night is always darkest before the dawn. So maybe this is a sign of, you know, even greater resistance to come. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, and last note to make about this particular event, I guess from an esoteric angle, of Prince Heinrich the Thirteenth, the sort of member of the AFB, this right-wing right -wing party is... Uh, of course, he, in his some of the German interviews, he does talk about his relationship to Russia and the fact that you know the House of Reuss, his last name, his name is Prince Heinrich the Thirteenth of Reuss. Reuss in German means Russian Rus. That's why. Why? It's because during the First Reich, so going back to the Holy Roman Empire, so the First Reich, we never speak about the Third, the Second. His family goes all the way back to the First, and his family are, are essentially descendants of. Of Henrik the Henrik the Russian, essentially, his name was Henrik the First of Rus, 
And so his essential last name, funny enough that this particular guy is is the apparent leader of this conspiracy, and his last name is literally uh, Henrik the Russian. Uh, I mean, uh, all things considered, it is a little bit interesting. And notice that in some of the English websites do not mention this connection whatsoever. And by English, I mean even basic ones like Encyclopedia Britannica, Wikipedia. They kind of they do not allude to his relationship to the Russian Imperial Orthodox Houses, which had, of course, God's anointed rulers like in related to this particular man none of, none of this is mentioned so it is a little bit on the esoteric side but it is interesting to mention prince heinrich the 13th yeah definitely uh the blood of uh, orthodox christian emperors are in his veins and here he is of course standing up to the liberal hegemony now ruling over germany very very curious no i think i think as a point of interest we'll probably be keeping up with his case and the trial and everything you know we hope that you know the best comes for him pray for pray for germany pray for Pray that the aristocrats of the continent can embrace Christ and, you know, perhaps stand as a bit more of a bulwark against the nonsense of Globo Homo. But to move away from that a little bit, we, of course, this will be our last episode before the elections in Cyprus. And I'm not trying to blackpill anybody, but it's not necessarily looking amazing. I will have an article about this probably on Saturday. You know, it'll probably already be out by the time you're listening to this. Regardless... Uh, by the time you might be listening to this, a lot of the election might have already been decided. You know, things might be, we might be see who the top three candidates are. We have a pretty good guess of that. I'm, I'm thinking it will be, my guess is Metropolitan Athanasios, Metropolitan Isaiah, and Metropolitan Theophytos will be the top three. It'll be a bit of a battle for that third place spot. So pray, uh, if you, and all, and pray for, uh, even after the election, pray that, you know, the Synod makes the correct choice on the actual Archbishop. But unfortunately, with the political interference going on, it's ramped up, and it seems that Metropolitan Isaiah of Tamasos, another former stalwart supporter of Metropolitan Onufri and the canonical church in Ukraine, he is not just flipped on that, he seems to have just been completely co-opted by the EP, and frankly, it seems his State Department, you know, Global American Empire uh, lackeys. I want to read a bit of an article here on Orthochristian. Um, he, he doesn't just talk about going and meeting with... Uh, the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, he says that, of course, the Cypriot Church has an obligation to support the Ecumenical Patriarch and uh, all these other things, and that they're at the best height of their relationships ever. But he said some very, you know, strange statements talking about his him changing his mind on the Ukrainian situation. He says, and I quote, that the theological facts have changed as well as the national facts which this seems a bit sophistic to me kind of concerning basically as a way of justifying completely politicizing this synodal decision. But besides saying that, you know, they stand with the EP, he also seems to have suddenly come out as a, not a liberal, but as just a hands-off approach regarding, uh, ask, I'll, I'll read this from the article, asked whether the church should have positions on issues like abortion, cremation, euthanasia, and sexuality, and intervene politically on such issues. The hierarch of Tommaso says, the church respects and protects the gift of God, which is our very life, dignity, and health. We always act supportively, consultively, and pray that people will be enlightened. Our concern is that human life is uninterrupted for social reasons, but at the same time, we shouldn't forcibly intervene and judge people's legitimate and personal decisions without even having proposals to solve problems. Well, to sit around and pretend that the church doesn't have, you know, thousands of years of tradition to solve the problems of, you know, unwed mothers and, you know, unwanted pregnancy, that's... I'm sorry, I'll just say it, that's just ridiculous. And to balk at the church's responsibility to uphold social mores in one of the most ancient Orthodox sees in the world, founded by the Apostle Barnabas. I mean, this is just I mean I mean this is this is, you know, get this is beyond just getting a phone call level stuff. Like what is I I'm just stunned at what must be the level of control going on behind the scenes that someone could flip so harshly and become such a and just immediately start walking so so lockstep in line with the agenda of, you know, Patriarch Bartholomew, who's called, you know, the Green Patriarch. He's this, he's this kind, you know, he's the Francis of Orthodoxy, as people say. Like, what is, what is the specter? It's definitely incredibly suspicious. I'm noticing some certain trends in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Patriarch, Patriarch Bartholomew participating in these world events recently, you know, uh, essentially meeting up with Catholic leaders as well as some of the international dignitaries of Moldovan politicians, American politicians, just things are really amping up on that end. And of course, the Metropolitan of Cyprus, uh, the Archbishop of Cyprus, that is the leader of the Cypriot Church, one of, I guess, one of the great things that the election can give us is that the the next Archbishop could lead Cyprus out of the schism but from Russia. So there was only there are only four churches in the world which have disconnected themselves from Russia by supporting the schismatic and you know, degenerate Ukrainian 
Ukrainian false church, and that is the Church of Athens, the ecumenical patriarch from Constantinople or Istanbul, you know, the Church of Cyprus, which is the one we're speaking about now, and of course the Church of Alexandria in Africa. So those four churches, if Cyprus, of course, leads the way after these elections this Sunday on the 18th, this will be a huge kind of, it may in fact spearhead the movement towards, say, okay, maybe reuniting with Russia, maybe we can come back into communion, maybe we'll stop supporting the schismatic church. So that's why this election is important, because it could the Cypriot church may be the first of many that will, of course, reunite, I guess, this the Greek, the Greek Orthodox world, or at least half of the Greek Orthodox world, back with the Russian and the Slavic nations, or at least have this conservative unity again within within Orthodoxy, not on a theological level, but at least on an ecclesiastical administrative level. It's a really big, I mean, there's a lot of weight on the shoulders of the next Archbishop, and it is a bit sad, like reading, you know, Metropolitan Isaiah saying that, no, whatever happens in this election, the Archbishop will not change his decision on Ukraine. Like, why is that Metropolitan Isaiah? Like, I wish we could ask him, like, why, what exactly are, what justifications are you using, sir? Like, your eminence, and of course, you know, the Archbishop, uh, the Archbishop Chrysostomus, his predecessor, was of course in full support of Ukraine and full support of the Greek, um, you know, the Greek, uh, the Greek, metro, the Greek patriarch granting autocephaly to Ukraine. So it's just a, it's a bit, it's a bit of a harsh situation at the moment. It doesn't look like the Cypriot Church. Well, I guess everything is in God's hands, and of course we wish, me, myself, and Conrad that you know, the Orthodox world is reunited ecclesiastically and we all come into communion with each other so we can continue on this long thousand-year-old journey of harmony and, of course, preaching the, world of, uh, the word of Christ through the world. No, it's true. And like Cyprus, again, is one of the most ancient historic Greek seas. And even if this election, unfortunately, doesn't lead to a complete, you know, restoration of canonical unity with the true church from Cyprus, I don't think that it will necessarily, hopefully not, I think this is, we, even if Metropolitan Neophytos doesn't win, we have to hope it was Metropolitan Athanasios instead of Metropolitan Isaiah, because Metropolitan Isaiah seems like he would be more eager to actually enforce this recognition of the schismatics across the other bishops, whereas historically Cyprus, you know, the archbishop recognized them and a few other bishops, but Metropolitan Neophytos, Metropolitan Athanasios, previously Metropolitan Isaiah, of course, Metropolitan Nikiforos, and others that we've talked about never had any, never had anything to do with them. So they've had a bit more of their own voice, and hopefully that will continue. And, you know, if unfortunately what we want doesn't happen and Metropolitan Neophytos remains the Metropolitan of Morfu, which he's, you know, always done a great job at, perhaps that will be God's plan, and it will be his will that, you know, he's, he's free from, you know, the archiepiscopal responsibilities to lead you know, the revived mission to the Turks in the north or to, you know, prepare his people for further, you know, persecution as he's already done such a fabulous job of doing. So there's no need to despair. As Dimitri said, it's, of course, in God's hands. But uh, again, we, we, we do hope that, uh, we, we just hope that there's not too much, it, when we see the interference behind the scenes, and as I talked about in the previous episode, people like Elias Damianakis and Archbishop El Pito Fotos here in America, you know, clearly traveling over there to put their foot on the scale, to use their power, to flex their political muscles. Like, this is this is just disgusting. And it really has no place in orthodoxy. And, to, and just imagine what it looks to people that aren't orthodox or people that are want to become orthodox. It's just, it's, it's extremely, it's, it's, a, it's a bad look. So I hope that, you know, pray for our hierarchs and pray that those, those urges to engage in that activity would, you know, go away. Yeah, and of course, um, <clears throat> politics and administrative manipulations have always taken place, I guess, in the church, even since the time of the apostles, when even apostles fell away, not just Judas, but some of the apostles out of the 72. So it's like people are always fallible and willing, not willing, but they could be willing to make mistakes and, of course, uh, step away from, you know, it's a two-way relationship with God. Man can always make that decision to step away from God and, of course, abandon the ways of truth. And as we saw, of course, in the recent movie that came out, Man of God, about in St. Nectarius of Egina, St. Nectarius, and you can go check this movie out, um, I believe, it, I'm not sure if it was on Netflix, but definitely on Apple TV, this great movie that came out last year it talks about this great saint who was actually in the runner-up to become the patriarch of, of Constantinople, the, the ecumenical patriarch, and this great monk, this bishop, he, he was, due to manipulation and politics, he was kind of, um, you know, he, he was not, not just defeated, he wasn't even allowed to run in the end. So we even have stories from the last 200 years where great saints have, you know, God has probably providentially tried to put them on the path of, you know, becoming these leaders in the church, but of course, fallible humans in their pride and, you know, prelist and other spiritual delusions have taken those opportunities away from them, or at least served to harm their, you know, 
particular standing in the church, as we're seeing here, Metropolitan Neopetus of Morphu, a perfect candidate, a righteous man. You know, he's done nothing but give the greatest advice in the last two years to not just Greek Orthodox people, because Metropolitan Neopetus only speaks Greek, but his words have been translated into Russian, into English, into all these international languages. And he's given us so much advice, not just for the COVID pandemic, but also for this Ukrainian conflict. And, you know, we read his words very often on our podcast. And of course, he, we think he would be the best candidate. But again, uh, everything is in the hands of God. And uh, God gives an opportunity not just to the good people, but also to those who seek to do harm to, you know, amend their ways and to make the correct decisions. And look, uh, I guess we'll just have to see what happens this, this weekend. And we'll get back to you next week. And, you know, we'll speak about the outcomes and what potentially this may have, this may actually spell the prognosis for the future of Cyprus and also the Greek and the Russian Orthodox ecclesiastical world. Oh, yeah, it's, it's obviously one of the stories we follow the most on this podcast. And before uh, I get more of your words in each on actually what's going on in Ukraine and people getting sent to the front lines and who, you know, the church is getting involved. Just to, I quickly wanted to say about Metropolitan Neophytos and the situation is he is truly a living link to many of the spiritual giants and the prophets of our time, St. Paisio, St. Porfirios. And I just want to make a quick point that, you know, there is obviously the, always the risk of people getting caught up in you know, in Greek culture and getting too caught up in political prophecies and stuff and their disdain for Turks and all these sorts of things. And it's true that you shouldn't just believe every rumor you hear from maybe a priest or a monk about a prophecy. And you should, it, it, I've heard it before that the most important is to see which ones are written down, and that's true. But there's only, there's actually a level even above those that have been written down and approved by the church, and that is the oral tradition of the saints, spiritual children themselves, especially the hierarchical ones who are, who then make the decision to speak publicly in that way. That's That's actually one of the one of the truest traditions of the church. That's what St. Paul meant when he said that, you know, keep to the traditions you've been taught, whether by word or by letter. And so, sure, when someone just says something offhand from that they say is from a saint, you shouldn't take it as much as, you know, when you read that saint's writings. But if a saint's disciple, you know, who reads his writings, who makes sure that his, who, who has edited his writings, who have made sure that they were accurate, when he, you know, from his heart, you know, from the pulpit or from, you know, a place of teaching says what a saint said, that's, you know, that's a living link to the saints, and that's how the tradition lives in the Orthodox world. And it's so important that that's why it would be so fantastic if he were, of course, the Archbishop, because if, if all of our hierarchs were those prioritized their relationship with the saints of their previous years, that would just be, that would just be fantastic. That's what the beauty of apostolic succession is, you know. But uh, all that aside, I want to, not that we're going back to a Ukraine sit rep, but there's been a bit of a development, you know, with new metropolitans even appearing on the front lines ministering to their flocks dimitri yeah i think it's interesting though we just need to add the fact that the ukrainian conflict yeah not just on the military end it's been a bit back and forth but also in in relation to the church recently the church in ukraine has experienced extreme pressure from zelensky and from the zelensky government you've probably seen the photographs all over twitter like you know oh canonist me i've been posting some conrad has been reposting with well, the world war now twitter of course has been publishing these uh, i guess these pretty despicable photos of ukrainian federal agents raiding orthodox christian churches mostly russian ones but also i suppose any church that that they're deemed to be you know breaking the law and also spreading russian propaganda or for whatever other reason of course there's all kinds of stories developing on that end <clears throat> now we noticed that the fact that um the russian church meanwhile of course some of the russian bishops are so it's been about 10 11 months now since the conflict has begun but the russian church has made it quite clear that yes they are in support of the special military operation so much so that we have metropolitans traveling and metropolitans in the orthodox church are high very high-ranking bishops traveling almost 600 kilometers from the Solovetsky, famous Solovetsky monastery up in Russia's north. Uh, the Metropolitan Porfirios traveled to the Russian front lines, to Donbass, to Donetsk and Lugansk, to visit the people, to give them blessings, to, you know, hand out humanitarian aid, as well as to have open prayers, praying for the Russian troops stationed there. So we have a literal Metropolitan from the Russian north who is, you know, a really famous monk and ascetic traveling to the front lines. This is something like unprecedented, at least on this level. We notice... On the Ukrainian end, no Ukrainian bishop or metropolitan, even from the schismatic church, has actually actively attended the war front yet. So Metropolitan Porfirios appearing on the front lines as this sort of beacon of hope and, I guess, spiritual guidance to the Russian troops is... And as well as the Ukrainian troops, frankly, like, I'm sure anybody can read up on his words. Metropolitan Porfirios has many of his flock are actually from Ukraine as well. So him actually appearing there on the front lines is this, uh, I guess, new development that, look, uh, it's we're very hopeful about it. And of course, other bishops like Bishop Sabas of Zelenograd in Russia as well, posting incredibly, 
incredibly pro-Russian statements online, as many Russian bishops, of course, are very, and not just pro-Russian because of, you know, they, they want to support Putin or the United Russia Party or some particular politician. No, they're supporting Russia's historical, religious, traditional destiny, I guess, to protect orthodoxy, to be the defenders of orthodoxy. And orthodox Christianity in Ukraine at the moment is being persecuted, as we're seeing in all the photos and all the reports. The Ukrainian federal agents are raiding churches, monasteries, cathedrals. Of course, um, but, you know, finding orthodox books as well as Russian orthodox, you know, political agitation material and persecuting as well as prosecuting illegally uh, some of these orthodox clergymen. This is, uh, I, think, I think, horrendous. And we've never seen this sort of open persecution in the Ukraine in the last eight years, at least. No, it's, it's, it's true, and it's really, it is encouraging to see the Metropolitan there in one sense, because, again, while we want this to end as quickly as possible, the conflict and the bloodshed, we, we also really hope that there's kind of a vision from the Russian forces of a, of a plan to help restore unity in Ukraine, and a plan to help minister and help rebuild these churches and these communities that have been terrorized since 2014, and then, of course, you know, now been in the middle of a war zone. And, you know, we're seeing... You know, fantastic bishops, you know, stood up against COVID tyranny and, you know, all sorts of nonsense and globalism in the past, you know, five years, like Metropolitan Luke of Zaporozhia, you know, and he's now under sanctions uh, from the government and his, you know, his flock is, of course, ardently supporting him, priests and lay people alike. But seeing these things, it's just us Orthodox people, you know, we pay attention to the politics, the geopolitics is obviously going to have an effect on the church, but we really just hope that those Orthodox people, whether it's the soldiers themselves, the officers, or you know the the chaplains and the now metropolitans are on the front line. We hope that there is a a vision for how the most important unity and the most important realm of civilization and society in Ukraine can be reestablished, and that's of course the clerical world of the church and ecclesiology. Yeah, sort of spiritual unity, of course, underlines culture and underlines any other unity. And as we saw, of course, in the Yugoslavian civil war, returning back to the first subject. Well, the Yugos you notice the Yugoslavia, when it fell apart, how did it mainly separate? It separated into real religious groups formally. So you have Bosnia, Albania as the Muslim conglomerates. You have Serbia, um, Montenegro as the big Serbian groups. And Croatia, of course, is Catholic. These religious identities, they, of course, unite people. And as we're seeing that in Ukraine, of course, the Ukrainian people are very much divided on the religious. And you have Zelensky, who is, I guess, is somewhat of an Orthodox Jew. You have the neo-Nazis who are pagans. You have the schismatic Ukrainian church causing dysfunction. And of course, the Russian church just trying to unite everyone uh, under a common understanding that, look, we're all members of the same church. We should stop um, sort of, uh, we should stop fighting and kind of have at least a dialogue about, you know, through in a Christian sense, like no more no more endless war based on, say, these vague ideas of retaking the Donbass or retaking Crimea. This is, of course, absolutely absurd in the Russian view of things. Yeah, I think we are, uh, we're starting to see that the presence of the bishop in the Metropolitan really kind of shows a spiritual seriousness that, you know, is happening. And I believe as this goes on, well, on the one hand, the public may be somewhat critical of Russia's, you know, lack of willing to take willingness to take the gloves off and kind of go total war on Ukraine. I don't think it's really easy to say that Russian public opinion has perpetually just been shifting away from the West and away and just more in the more just towards the fact that we just need to be doing everything we can to preserve our people against the encroaching influence of globalism, the West. And for many in Russia, the message that resonates the most would be anti Satanism. Many people might be still holdovers from Soviet times and view it as, you know, anti capitalism in some regard. But even then it would be more of an anti-globalist capitalism, not some kind of, you know, true Marxist fundamental. So I think that's important to recognize. But again, it's important to also realize that all these fronts in World War III that we're talking about do have some relation either to orthodoxy, the former SSSR, historic Christianity, you know, whether it's Armenia, Azerbaijan, Serbia, Kosovo, Ukraine, uh, even, you know, China, Thailand, that has, that, that goes back to times even before the Sino-Soviet split. So like this... The 20th century is, of course, echoing on, and we're still, of course, facing the the classic anti. We're, we're still facing the the specter of Boomer World War II revisionist history that people are just have lumped onto Russia as the evil guy now, now. That hopefully one of the things as multipolarity rises will be kind of the end of that, and we won't have to hear about these, about really brain dead, you know, <laughs> historical takes. Yeah, of course. And like, let's just uh, give a little disclaimer here. And regardless of the tweets we put out in the, in the next coming weeks, it does seem like the Ukrainian bishops are under extreme duress and coercion. So any particular statements, I would say, at least 
This is my personal opinion, but Ukrainian bishops, especially Metropolitan Onufri, who are under persecution at the moment, Metropolitan Onufri is the head of the Ukrainian Autonomous Church, right? But he is technically still uh, in the Russian local church and in, in you know part of that particular large jurisdiction. And Metropolitan Onufri, he has stated very openly in the last week that, look, we're, we're going to distance ourselves from Russia, so much so that we're going to stop praying for Patriarch Kirill at our liturgies. This is a very painful message from him and a little bit unprecedented, but we won't go so far as to judge Metropolitan Anufri because he's technically a political prisoner now sitting in Kiev at the moment in his home. Of course, the Ukrainian federal agents are probably right outside his door monitoring him, watching his, you know, checking his internet history, checking who he's contacting, who he's calling, who is messaging. I bet the whole thing, the whole place is bugged, the entire monastery in which he currently abides. So the Ukrainian church is not exactly free and it's not exactly um, in, in, the, in the right sort of, uh, in the right space to make these, uh, statements that we should take incredibly seriously. Yes, the situation is serious, but let's not take the statements of some of these Ukrainian bishops to heart. And of course, um, I just want to mention just some backstory, I guess, for those interested. Well, how big is the Russian church overall? Well, I've actually just double checked. I've been reading a couple articles and it's really hard to grasp as to find an English source listing the entirety of the Russian church. I guess how many bishops there are. The Russian church in 2022 has reached the number of 400 bishops exactly on the dot. 400. Next year, there will be at least 402 bishops. There are two bishops, I guess, being trained at the moment in the Russian church. Now, mind you, 85 out of 400 of those bishops are located in the Ukraine and are technically Ukrainian Orthodox bishops. 85. So that's almost a quarter. So we have about, you know, one fifth, 20, 25% of all bishops are in the Ukraine. Notice that's probably why the globalists and all these world powers are demanding so much pressure, so much bloodshed in this Ukrainian land. Because look, technically, Almost like uh, almost a quarter of all Orthodox Russians are living in the Ukraine, including the bishops, the clergy, and the bishops in the Orthodox Church are not just your average priest or deacon. These people hold a very high rank. They hold the gift of apostolic succession. You know, they've been blessed by God to you know handle ministry and sa and handing out the sacraments and things of that nature. These are very important people, and 85 out of 400 of them are located in the Ukraine. This is why. We think, at least, you know, speaking kind of metaphysically, metapolitically here, this is why the Satanists and the globalists of the world are focusing on the Ukraine so heavily. It's because it is a heartland of orthodoxy. It is this very important region, okay? This is, of course, underlining everything else, and regardless of who wins, this will be the reality. Oh, it's true, and as I mentioned on the last episode where I was recording solo, uh, you know, our podcast, the things we talk about are well beyond what is, you know, deemed worthy of extreme persecution, arrest, and derision by the Ukrainian government. Just, you know, our, I mean, everyone kind of speaks, a lot of people in Ukraine speak English, so even English language content I don't think would be, you know, off the table. And Dimitri made a post about it, I referenced it, a book of, you know, there's a book of prophecies that was literally shown in, you know, the, the pickup, you know, the confiscation photo that Ukrainians took of their, you know, what they took. And it was this, it's this book that references so many things that we've actually talked about on this show. Dimitri actually has a bit of backstory on that. Yeah, so in the early 1990s, as soon as Russia and the um, Soviet censorship ended, Russia started publishing all this Orthodox material. And one of the books that was published was this uh, about 500-page compendium of Orthodox uh, lives of saints and as well as clairvoyant prophecies about Russia and Russia's future in the world. And of course, so there were so many saints in the last 200 years that spoke about Russia that in fact, a lot of their sayings have not yet been fulfilled. They were clairvoyant prophecies. And some of the things we speak about on the podcast, of course, are prophecies from recent years, from Elder Paisios, from Metropolitan uh, Neopithos of Morphu. And this book was published, I think, in 1991 or 92. It's called Russia Before the Second Coming. The Second Coming of Christ, that is. So what will happen in Russia in the, you know, in the coming decades or centuries before Christ returns to judge you know, to judge us all at the final judgment and to cleanse the cleanse the cleanse the world. And this book was published by a very mysterious monarchist, Orthodox monarchist author named Sergei Fomin. And Sergei, he's such a pious person, there is, you won't find a single interview of him on YouTube. I believe all the videos have been deleted. He, What he does is he just runs his live journal blog. He's, he's looking actually to publish more historical books. I think he's a historian by profession. And he just chose to publish this huge compendium of Orthodox prophecies. Um, I'm going to say about 95% of that book is just absolutely well-cited and I do recommend everybody get a copy, at least, like, hopefully in the future we're going to most likely publish an English version of this book, but it, it is absolutely a, a must-have, a must-read. Read. In Russia, it's been republished multiple times in the last three decades. Russians are absolutely consuming the, you know, 
uh, like consuming this content and just everybody almost has a copy of this book but Sergei Fomin interestingly enough like some of his backstory like who is this guy how dare he write like this book well he's just a pious orthodox Christian who he didn't spend time in the gulags himself like Solzhenitsyn or some of these other folks but he was uh, he was a pious Moscovite he lived in Moscow and it, there's a story from the 1980s when the Russia was still under communist rule you know religion was kind of viewed as something very cringe very kind of fringe sort of thing people would laugh at you if you go to church especially if you're a young man but Sergei for men was about in his late 20s and he would actually make processions reading the psalms and reading the jesus prayer around the huge swimming pool which the swimming pool in moscow was uh, the big public pool built on top of the site where the savior uh, christ the savior cathedral stood of course now the swimming pool was removed in the 90s and the cathedral this is the huge white cathedral standing in moscow was repl uh, replaced the pool but before the cathedral was there this uh, this pious man sergey for men would walk processions of course around this pool praying to god that may god's church here be restored again this is in the 1980s and no one really remembers this the only reason i actually found note of this was because yeah one of the interviewers actually asked him this question in russian he's like yeah you know i used to do that in the 80s he's a really humble guy so this humble orthodox christian like layman published this awesome book and now this book well, how does this relate to Ukraine? Well, copies of this book are all over these Ukrainian monasteries. The Ukrainian monks love this book, and it's about Russia, and it talks about the Russian Empire, not the Russian Empire, but the Russian Tsardom, the, I guess, the, the Orthodox Empire returning to Russia, returning to Ukraine, speaks about the future of the Ukrainian Russian people reuniting. Of course, this is all banned extremist material. Ukrainians hate this stuff. And so, but, but Ukrainians, I mean, Ukrainian neo-Nazis, those supporting Zelensky, these liberals, separatists, whatever you want to call them, these extremists. And of course, these Ukrainian federal agents are going to be raiding the monasteries, finding copies of this book, reading through it, and of course, persecuting and prosecuting the monks as well as clergy and Orthodox lay people who can t who have this book. So it's kind of like, uh, I guess you can say the Nazi book burnings, but this is like the SBU Ukrainian neo-Nazi book burnings of our time. No, it really is, and it's unfortunate that the powers that be. You know, that's it's part of why I was so encouraged by what we were talking about earlier. That I hope the Russians are somewhat taking the spiritual angle seriously because the Ukrainians clearly see any form of reference to. Russian Orthodoxy at all, and you know the Russian Orthodox tradition as a threat to you know their project. So I think it's important that you know we that 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 that, that the church authorities and you know Russian you know you know forces that are people in Russia and you know people with power and money that are that consider the church the most important institution. I hope that they are you know doing their part to make to make that voice heard so that it isn't just you know a strictly military political operation. But you know moving on, you know we're getting near the end of what we're going to be talking about here. I want to, you know, we talked about, you know, December 5th, you know, it's been since then the oil price cap has kind of been, you know, enforced. And we actually saw a crisis at one point in the Bosphorus and Dardanelles and ships are being held up. That's actually been resolved. Insurance, it was an insurance issue. And so now Russian ships with crude oil and others are actually still being able to go through the straits. But uh, what is it? I believe it was, this is from Sputnik. This recently came out from the State Department, who is this? James O'Brien the Office of Sanction Coordination in the U.S., he said, We expect that China, India, and Turkey, as major buyers of Russian oil, will negotiate very good prices for themselves, and the prices will come under the price cap, which would be in compliance even if the countries don't formally join the price cap coalition, O'Brien said during a press conference. So, I don't know how, I don't know what he, I mean, he might just be, I guess he's just BSing everybody, because I don't see how, you, I don't think the price cap is necessarily a good price, but... If that's actually true and he has confidence in that, you know, that would be a big issue because Russia obviously has no interest in obeying a price cap and would like to just keep selling oil to China, India, and Turkey at, you know, good. I'm sure they would give them a good deal, but they have, they still have no interest in having those countries abide by a price cap. And I don't see why they would be constrained to the price cap even if they didn't join the coalition. But again, this is the straits, the straits, considering there's two of them and there's so much, you know, complex logistics and international treaties. The U.S. is going to try its best to squeeze Turkey to close the straits to stop Russia from being able to get its oil to these other countries that are willing to buy it for less, which is why, of course, the Turkish regime and the elections are so important because they have that power. But uh, we're obviously going to be watching that closely. But hopefully, I, I predict that the U.S. is just like saying that and is going to kind of take an L. But, you know, we'll see. Maybe maybe it'll heat up. Yeah, so for those interested in the last two weeks, of course, uh, as Conrad mentioned, the price cap for Russia selling crude oil to, I guess, European as well as Western countries has been set at a cap, which means Russia, no, none of these countries will buy crude oil from Russia, especially sent by ships 
for um, over $60 a barrel, 60 American dollars a barrel. Notice the market price of crude oil at the moment is around $75 a barrel, and that's during what we call now a recession. So that's about a 20% cut. So these Western powers are trying to cut Russian income through crude oil by about 20%. Now, notice Russia may still sell crude oil for a discounted price to some of these, like, you know, Asian superpower nations such as India and China for roughly, you know, $70 a barrel, 65 Like, of course, Russia will still sell it over the cap to these nations, as Conrad mentioned. Like, yeah, and of course, it is unfair. The cap is unfair. It's all based on the Ukrainian-Russian war. It's just the West trying to essentially affect and negatively impact the Russian economy, which, of course, uh, heavily depends on fossil fuel sales, which, you know, pisses off the, the greenies as well as some of the uh, climate change warriors. So, yeah, we'll just see how this kind of develops. But at the moment, the cap is not being obeyed by Russia in any form. Russia does not recognize it. No one's going to sell, even during the peak COVID crisis, uh, crude oil prices, I think, only fell below $60 for about a month or so. So $60 is a very low price for a barrel of oil. Like, it is, these are pretty extreme sanctions. No, it's true. And that's obviously, with, with, with Turkey and the Kurds, there's all sorts of oil wars going on there. As we know, the Iraq war was basically just a war to secure pipelines and pathways for free uh, you know, Israeli oil, and then the Israelis also now take oil from Syria, and the U.S. takes the oil from Syria. So this whole area is very tied up in the being the global energy, you know, war and blockade wars and, you know, pipeline wars. There's so many critical pipelines that affect relationships between Azerbaijan, Israel, Iran, all these places, and of course the Kurds are in there. But, you know, there's we've talked about a lot of these different fronts, and we've there's a few other things we maybe wanted to mention, Dimitri, about maybe Moldova, as well as Armenia, Azerbaijan. Before we kind of wrap up and tie everything together, is there anything you maybe wanted to mention about some of these other places? I've seen in Hungary, like some, we mentioned some of those uh, possible future referendums and some of these, you know, Russian telegram channels, even from like, you know, Russian officials, they, they post these maps and almost all of them now have like Transcarpathia as like supposedly Hungarian. So is there anything you wanted to say about maybe some stuff going on in these other more not as hot, but still very relevant fronts. Yeah, I think it's easy to predict, at least for the near future, or at least the next couple of years, that Moldovan attitudes towards Russia will continue to deteriorate. Uh, there's, a, there's a large portion of Moldovan people, especially those in the patriotic and the more Romaniophilic, like those you know who align themselves with Romania, are very... They do have these attitudes towards Russia, uh, leftover baggage from the Soviet Union times when you know Soviet communists would pressure Romanians into doing things, and Romanians as well as Moldovan people, into doing things they weren't necessarily a fond of. So, of course... Moldovans still view Russians as these oppressors, and unfortunately, Moldova is uh, kind of still under the influence of NATO, and we do see, like, what is the prognosis here? Well, recently, the minister, the foreign minister of Moldova uh, actually visited the ecumenical patriarch. This is the bishop in um, Istanbul, the patriarch of Constantinople, who started the entire schism in the Ukraine. So we have, and mind you, who do you think the Moldovan bishops are under? They're, at the moment, Russia is actually servicing Moldova for all of its Orthodox needs. The bishops in Moldova are Moldovan, but they are part of the multicultural, you can say, Russian Orthodox Church. So we have Moldovan politicians who really dislike Russia traveling to Greece, traveling to the Greek bishops. Maybe there's going to be uh, this sort of a new granting of autonomy or autocephaly from the ecumenical patriarch to these Moldovan churches. That's just my prediction. I think that's a long-term goal. It would be a State Department funded, of course, NATO operation at the end of the day. It's not just the strictly orthodox, you know, sort of uh, granting Moldova independence based on some old traditions in the church. No, 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 this is a completely political action. I think that's kind of on the cards at the moment, very unfortunately, because what it's technically, what we're looking at here is a potentially a new schism, a very small one, but still one that's going to impact, I guess, the future perception of Moldova in the eyes of Romanians, Russians, as well as Greeks. Uh, this is quite bad. Well, ultimately, that might be where the real border, but future border dispute with NATO come in is unfortunately Transnistria, you know, if Russia takes Odessa, is likely they're going to connect to Transnistria. And then if that were to happen, the likelihood of Moldova rejoining Romania is very high because, you know, Moldovans, they speak Romanian. They're very like Romanians. It's their kind of cultural roots. So that's that's going to be likely. And regardless of what happens in Cyprus, both situations, I believe, motivate the EP. If, you know, the EP's man, Metropolitan Isaiah wins, they'll be emboldened to pursue their agenda in Cyprus if they lose I mean, in uh, Moldova if they lose they'll be like oh well we lost there we're gonna have to pursue our interests elsewhere much like you know when they as they've lost influence elsewhere and the Russian world has perhaps you know grown and they they've both been co-opted by the State Department as well as for their own you know 
even monetary purposes, to then expand their influence into places like Ukraine, into America, of course. That's their cash cow in GoArch. But we even saw as recent as, you know, it was this year when the Macedonian church was granted autocephaly by the Serbs and were, by the grace of God, brought back into communion. You know, a 50-plus-year-long schism was ended. What was the EP doing? Trying to con immediately gain control over the diaspora Macedonia churches and suddenly muddying the waters where the Macedonians accepted their tomos of autocephaly from the Serbs. But the EP, of course, like knowing it would happen, issued their own kind of thing, saying that, oh, well, this makes it legit, but no one cared. Like That was just them trying to save face because they realized that but the entire Macedonian thing and the reconciliation proved that the EP, what was doing in Ukraine, is complete nonsense. So it's um, it's very interesting. I might write an article about that as well. But Yeah, that's right. And I think the fears of the State Department, the fears of the powers of the world, right, the globalists, is, of course, they not they don't just fear, say, Russia, Serbia, even, even an Orthodox, really based Greece, or some of these really Christian countries coming back to Christianity, like even Germany, Germany becoming right-wing and conservative. These globalists, they fear... They fear, of course, these church institutions, these these uh, institutions and administrations that have held up for hundreds of years. They've held up through the Soviet times. They held up through the Tatar-Mongol yoke. They held up through the invasions of Napoleon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These institutions of the church, these local churches, they stand up through time for tribulations. And of course, what has Patriarch Kirill done? Why is there so much media? Why is there so many, so much propaganda against Patriarch Kirill? Well. Patriarch Kirill, Kirill, since he was elected in 2009, actually doubled the number of Russian bishops. Now, just to understand what that means, the Russian Empire at its peak had only roughly around 200 bishops in its jurisdiction. Now, 200 bishops, uh, you know, looking after 100 million Orthodox people, that's not a fair ratio. That's the bishops are just, you know, spread too thin. So Patriarch Kirill has made it his mission, I suppose, not just to, you know, expand the idea of the Russian world and to expand Orthodoxy and missionary work, but to actually improve church administration by increasing the number of bishops. And as we said earlier on the podcast, the, Russian, the number of Russian bishops has increased from 200 in 2009 to 400 in 2022. That's in more than a decade. Now, this is... I mean, an unprecedented feat in church history. In the last 500 years, not a single church leader, no, no, not an emperor, not a patriarch, not a synod, has achieved this sort of expansion of, of I guess, uh, the rights of bishops and, of course, the expansion of a church, that as Patriarch Kirill has. So, despite Patriarch Kirill's, Kirill's faults or previous, you know, statements or his positions or on ecumenism and all these other things, Patriarch Kirill, even for this, will probably be blessed by God because this is a huge undertaking. And that's probably why we see all these weird memes about him, all this abuse and all this disgusting stuff flowing out of these disrespectful people on Twitter as well as other platforms, you know, mostly Western anti-Orthodox sources. They attack Patriarch Kirill. Why? And why is it? It's not because he's a friend of Putin. It's not because he loves... You know, he loves Russia. Yes, he does love Russia because he's a Russian himself, but because he is actually improving church administration as we have not seen in the last 500 years. This is, I think, and I, I you know, I'm, obviously this is my personal opinion, but this should not be ignored. And no one speaks about this. The fact that a Russian number of bishops increased from 200 to 400, this needs to be taken into account. And as long as, you know, many years to Patriarch Kirill, of course, despite all of his flaws, he is a great man. He's a man of the 21st century who will be remembered for, you know, decades to come, if not, you know, the entirety of human history. Oh, yes. And again, like, God uses imperfect people to really build up the church for, you know, those living saints that are to come, you know, and I think you know, whether it's something prophesied or whether it's just something that comes out of, I mean, the, I, think, I believe they're ultimately one and the same, but whether it's just something that comes out of the prayerful roots of, you know, Russian Orthodox society, I think we're going to see the infrastructure that he's helped cultivate, you know, be a place where future, whether it's clergy or whether it's pious lay people or even politicians that embrace, you know, the civil aspect of the faith, I think we'll see that infrastructure be used well, and they're setting themselves this civilizational mm -hmm. groundwork that will serve them in the future, that people who are just desperately trying to meme a Russian military failure into existence, they just don't understand the depths at which, you know, Russia's fully emerging from its, from its you know, martyric communist yoke. Yeah, many men should just appreciate the fact that Russia was up under communist Bolshevik subjugation and now and is emerging out of a liberal out of a liberal democratic subjugation, you know, led by capitalist liberal values. And I'm not saying this from a Marxist sort of Hassan Piker perspective, but no, it's true. These capitalist values were ingrained so heavily in the nineties, they were just forcefully implanted, injected into Russian society. And how many people were corrupted, how many lives were lost, how many, you know, people left to to join Western 
you know, Western communities and, of course, abandon orthodoxy and Christianity. It's, you know, a huge tragedy. And this is one of the achievements of Putin, I suppose, as a as a sort of leader. He's turning Russia back into its, I guess, historical historical destiny of being this uh, bulwark of orthodoxy in the world. And, of course, uh, of course, this is good for Russian culture as well and Russian people in general, as we see demographics actually improving for the first time in for three decades or so since the Soviet times. It's pretty, pretty impressive, I think. No, no, it very much is. And again, this isn't to, you know, worship Russia or anything like that, but it's just to recognize that Christian civilization, you know, it's Christian civilization. And just because here in the West, it might be a bit alien to us, and you might still have a holdover of Russia as our enemy. It's, it's, I just always hearken back, like, you can just read accounts of, like, when Tsar Nicholas II was, you know, murdered and people heard about it. Like, people in America, like, there was weeping and mourning because, like, they understood the capacity and what it meant to, uh, for the emperor to have been killed, for there to be no more Christian emperor in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's, and to, and to finally see that previous imperial, you know, that to see the, the Christian Caesar, that society come back, you know, with even the, with the words of future czars, even on the lips of many of the saints that trumpeted in its return. I, that's something that I think Orthodox people, Christians everywhere, especially Orthodox people, I think should take, take note of, you know, I don't think it's out of line to say such a thing. No, no, I think it's, uh, and again, this is this is not just the gift that's given to Russia or Serbia or any of these Christian countries. It's a burden. It's a burden. They have to live up to the, the deeds that their Orthodox Christian ancestors have set out, that the saints have kind of set out at this blueprint, which they have to follow. And to step up from this blueprint is to lead your country into degeneracy and to abandon values. So as we can see in 2022, one of the things that has changed, of course, is the censorship of openly Russian, pro-Russian websites, not just Russian websites belonging to the Russian government, but websites belonging to Russian Orthodox sources. Like I believe some of the, some countries can't even access the official sources of the Russian Orthodox Church. And these, these of course are, this is important because censorship from the globalists has been such a power move that, such, such a weapon in their hands, like they've used it against Alex Jones, they've used it against some of these other figures, and of course now they're using it against Ye, regardless of what your opinions are, and, you know, Ye's particular powerful statements here and there, but, you know, it is a weapon that's being wielded against, say, Christians, those who don't think exactly as a globalist tell you that you should think. And we, we should mention the fact that, yeah, the church is a victim of this, the church cannot stand back and of course accept this sort of censorship from these anti-christian liberal you know liberal demagogues and these people pushing essentially a new world order hegemony no yeah regarding all of that we're getting near the end of the show i want to encourage everybody follow us on twitter world war now underscore uh and regarding that you know i mean that's very prescient because the twitter files have continued to drop uh, i believe the latest batch from matt taibbi were called twitter as an FBI client, or was it a CIA client, or whatever? And I think it was FBI, and they were just had a direct, like they had all these applications that were like portals, just direct reporting and listening to FBI requests. There was like in like a few month period, there was like 150 emails from the FBI, almost all requesting account, or even like small few thousand follower accounts requesting their removal, account deletion, content censorship, shadow banning, all this kind of stuff. And it's it's very obvious that. Like we've been saying for years, I mean, the entire internet in many ways is an intelligence project, like between Israeli intelligence and then uh, universities embedded with U.S. intelligence. That's kind of how the quote unquote internet as we know it came to exist. And I mean, even Twitter, I mean, anyone in the know knows it was ultimately built to facilitate the Arab Spring. And then they just kind of lumped it into, you know, big tech vulture capitalism and started selling its stock after, you know, Facebook started doing that. But its original goal was to be this like communication to spread you know, pro-democracy stuff to these Ba'athist countries in the Arab Spring, and it worked. It Almost all those countries, their leaders fell, with the exception of Assad, the Lion of Damascus. But now with uh, Elon Musk, of course, owning Twitter, we're literally getting all the dirty laundry aired out, which is one of the most beautiful things that comes when, a, whether it's a country or a corporation, it's one of the best things you can do is, you know, expose the garbage of the previous regime. And we're seeing that if Twitter was basically just a wing of the FBI for information control. And it's getting to the point where the information being revealed should should usher in total and like it should, from the perspective of the people, they should be calling for a complete and total regime change like to like 2016 basically we need to go back and then like go one by one through every federal employee and bureaucrat. As Trump basically did say this in his recent free speech policy statement, but we need to just go through and just completely gut the federal government and then find the replacements for the necessary jobs, and then everything else that's bloat, just cut it out. And these 
these these ideologues need to be uh, they need not be nowhere near power. And you know this Yol Roth character, of course, the guy at Twitter was just gleefully banning any sort of dissent. Like these 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 people are evil. And when it gets into things like church stuff, I mean, there have been orthodox people shadow banned for years. Content that's banned just for talking about being satanic. I mean, even Patrick Casey, whose show we went on, he was banned for just calling someone a freak, someone who's in drag, of course, and stuff like that. So this is a uh, this is a big battle, and hopefully. You know, it was pretty funny seeing Elon Musk ban all those people that were like doxing him and stuff. But at the same time, I would like to maybe see Ye come back, Alex Jones come back, these kinds of things. There's no need for, we don't we don't need to become Gab, but you know, just posting a symbol that has a swastika in it. You know, it's not necessarily ban worthy. So, with all that being said, you know, you might you have something to say about that, Dimitri. If not, you know, we'll get the plugs in and uh, finish this up. Yeah, I think censorship, especially from a liberal perspective, is always going to be detrimental to those opposing that particular perspective. It's just a just a matter of of opinion at that point. And I mean, uh, different civilizations have always used censorship to to meet their to meet their ends. And this particular globalist hegemony running Twitter at the moment, like we see in the Twitter files, essentially uh, American feds, American FBI agents, you know, part partaking of you know, literally working together to shut down the Joe Biden, um, the, the son of Joe Biden, Hunter Biden laptop story, and all these other things. Like we see this very actively now, but mind you, most of us have suspected this has been ongoing for years now. It's just the evidence comes out years later, and you know the media is again suppressing this evidence in the twitter file so it is of course a huge a huge boon and a huge um a huge pro into 2022 the fact that elon musk has purchased twitter and it is going to benefit this uh, i guess info war as alex jones coined it against the globalists and against their influence um it, regardless of whose side elon musk directly is the fact that he's opened the arena up to for us to partake in and this is exactly what we're going to do we're going to participate in it full force and not hold back on any front Oh, and just remember, Elon Musk may want to put a chip in your brain, but much like the Roman Empire killed, you know, countless Christians, it was the Roman road system that provided the, the you know, groundwork for the gospel to spread in much ways, as Metropolitan Iofito spoke about. The, some would say, demonic internet has allowed, myself included in many ways and others, to be exposed to the words of saints and orthodoxy and apostolic tradition, and now the, uh, the words of Metropolitan Iofito, who is, you know, so saintly and so uh, in 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 such a fantastic way has you know prepared us for these these days that we live in today. So with all that being said, you know be sure to uh, subscribe to us on Substack WorldWarNow.substack.com. Share this episode if you're listening on YouTube. Like and subscribe. It really helps us out. Uh, we're on Twitter WorldWarNow underscore. Uh, we're on Telegram WorldWarNow T E L E at the end WorldWarNow Telly. I'm of course on Twitter Gnome Rad Gnome Rad. Uh, Dimitri's on there. O Canonist. He has some great content. And uh, yeah, please uh, pray for the church, pray for the church in Cyprus. And uh, with all that being said, uh, Dimitri, you want to say goodbye? Yeah, and of course, we wish a Merry Christmas to all those celebrating on the new calendar and those uh, friends, you know, Protestants, Catholics, who will be celebrating Christmas on the 25th of December if our new episode doesn't air before then. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys. I think we'll have a couple more episodes before the end of the year, but either way, there's some more articles coming out during these coming holidays and do keep an, eye, keep an eye out on our Twitters as well as Telegram for the real uncensored stuff, which even on Twitter would probably not be appropriate. So Telegram is the place to, to go. And of course, subscribe to the Substack for the long form, well thought out answers to some of the questions you may have about the world at the moment and geopolitics. God bless everybody. Merry Christmas.